Hi, it's Greg from the Spotify original Serial Killers and Cults. On behalf of everyone here at Parcast Network, I'd like to wish all of our listeners a very happy holiday season. I'd also like to tell you about some special programming we have lined up for you. First, a Christmas special about an Illinois woman who claimed to speak with aliens, a group of peculiar carolers, and a series of apocalyptic predictions. Enjoy this episode on Dorothy Martin and the Seekers. Next week, be sure to tune in for our Best of 2021 picks, and join us for the first week of January for all new episodes. We thank you again for listening, and wish you a happy and healthy New Year. The sky was clear over the Oak Park neighborhood of Chicago on Christmas Eve, 1954. While children looked longingly at the presents tucked away beneath the tree, the sounds of caroling filtered in from outside. In the street, a group of about a dozen, known as the Seekers, gathered to sing carols. But they didn't look very jolly. Instead, there was a desperate strain in their voices, as if they were pleading with the heavens. As the hours stretched on, onlookers stopped by to investigate the commotion. Eventually, the crowd swelled to about 200, and the police were called to get a handle on the situation. The leader of the Seekers, 54-year-old Dorothy Martin, egged her followers on. Soon, she promised, a spaceship would come to rescue them from the wretched Earth, while those who stayed behind were doomed to perish in a cataclysmic flood. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults, a Spotify original from Parcast. Every Tuesday, we look at a cult's practices, its leader, and its followers. You can find all episodes of Cults and all other Spotify originals from Parcast for free on Spotify. This week in a one-part episode, we're discussing Dorothy Martin, an Illinois woman who claimed she could speak with aliens in the 1950s. Over time, she recruited around a dozen followers who called themselves the Seekers. We'll explore Dorothy's apocalyptic predictions and those caught in the frenzy she created. We'll also learn how the Seekers contributed to one of the most important psychological breakthroughs of the past century. We have all that and more coming up. Stay with us. The holiday season seems full of promise. Christmas stories are typically about love, togetherness, and giving. We always expect things to work out for the best in the end. But in 1954, Dorothy Martin's holiday messages brought something very different. She believed Christmas Eve would bring salvation for the chosen few, and a catastrophic end for billions more. Yet no one would have pegged Dorothy Martin as a charismatic, apocalyptic leader. To the outside world, she lived an invisible, unremarkable life in suburban Chicago. She dressed fashionably enough and worked hard to maintain her respectability, but sometimes it seemed like those around her barely even noticed her existence. She had a husband who she'd been with for so long that the two had fallen into a comfortable routine. While she stayed home, he worked at a distributing company in the city. As the years wore on, Dorothy grew dissatisfied with her humdrum life. She felt empty. She wanted a purpose. Many others no doubt felt the same way. In the nuclear age, the world had spiraled through the looking glass. The future had arrived, and the world suddenly opened up. Dorothy hoped the new possibilities would give her meaning. When she was living in New York City in her younger years, she started exploring alternative religions and spirituality, including theosophy, the I Am movement, and Dianetics. She continued pursuing these interests quietly in Oak Park, Illinois. She was like a sponge, almost totally without preconceived judgments. She only wanted to soak in as much information as possible. And eventually, she found her answer. While little is known about Dorothy's family history, we do know that her father passed away at some point. It was likely a significant loss, one that propelled her further in her quest for understanding. Vanessa is going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but we have done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Greg. 
When people lose those close to them, they often turn towards faith to process their grief, a phenomenon known as spiritual coping. Dr. Elizabeth Crumry Mancuso, a psychology professor at Pepperdine University, defines it as any form of coping that incorporates what a person holds sacred. Spiritual coping can consist of behaviors, but can also take the form of thoughts, feelings, or attitudes. Mancuso notes that unlike other methods of coping, taking solace in the spiritual can help those who are plagued by existential questions about life and death. In Dorothy's case, her New Age beliefs may have guided her after the loss of her father. Sometime after his death, Dorothy had a realization. One day in 1953, as she was sitting home alone, she gradually drifted off. Her mind went blank. And then, suddenly, she lost the feeling in her arm. Pins and needles pricked her skin as if it had fallen asleep. A strange sensation washed over her. It was as if she was hit with a jolt of electricity. She instinctively grabbed a pen and put it in her numb hand. A moment later, it started moving on its own. What appeared just looked like chicken scratch at first. Dorothy squinted until a simple message was revealed. It was from her departed father. The prose was far from elegant. It didn't contain any deep answers about the meaning of life. Instead, her father seemed to be asking for Dorothy's mother to plant flowers in the spring. Dorothy was awestruck. She believed she genuinely channeled her father's spirit. She was so excited that she told her mother, who will call Judy, about the story. Judy was not interested. She may have believed her daughter was playing a cruel and tasteless joke. She told Dorothy she didn't want anything to do with her mysterious messages. But Dorothy was undeterred. She could feel she was on the verge of finally finding her purpose. Soon, she found that by keeping her mind blank and open, she could channel her father again. On a few more occasions, she received additional messages from him. But for the most part, they were as mundane as the first had been. There was no groundbreaking information about what lay beyond the mortal plane. And she couldn't find much support. Her husband didn't pay much mind to her new abilities. He never outright condemned his wife, but he made it clear that, like Judy, he wasn't a believer. Dorothy ignored him, too. The pull of her new path forward was too strong. Over time, her husband's opinions faded to nothing more than white noise. She pushed her abilities further. Not long after the messages from her father's spirit began, another breakthrough came. A different being, who introduced himself as Elder Brother, brushed against her consciousness. According to Dorothy, Elder Brother initially claimed to be a higher being from Venus, who wanted to help her cultivate her connection with her father. However, Elder Brother quickly changed his tune. Apparently, Dorothy's father wasn't reliable enough. He was too consumed with earthly pursuits. Eventually, the messages from her father stopped altogether. By April 1954, she began channeling information from another strange entity who called himself Sananda and claimed to be an alien incarnation of Jesus. A being from the mythical planet Clarion, Sananda became Dorothy's main spiritual contact. While Elder Brother still came to her on occasion, Sananda became her most reliable ally. In time, Dorothy learned she was a messenger for these beings that she called Guardians. She claimed the Guardians would one day bring cosmic intelligence to the rest of the planet. The prophecy empowered Dorothy in a way no other spiritual teachings could. This one was all her own. It granted her an explicit, important purpose, one with global implications. The knowledge empowered Dorothy, but she kept it mostly to herself. After her mother's rejection and her husband's ambivalence, she wasn't comfortable sharing her messages with just anyone. Still, she attended plenty of New Age events in her area, likely as a way to cautiously search for kindred spirits. She often mentioned, at least in passing, her mystical connection with Sananda. In such a welcoming environment, people were more apt to take her seriously. In March of 1954, word of Dorothy's experiences reached Charles Lawhead, a physician at Michigan State College. Though 10 years younger than Dorothy, his spiritual path had been far more traditional. In the 1940s, Charles and his wife Lillian were passionate Christian missionaries who worked overseas. While spending a few years in Egypt, Lillian began experiencing strange nightmares. This led the couple to investigate esoteric occult ideas, searching for a cure to her fears. 
It seems that this experience transformed them, and soon they turned away from their Protestant beliefs. Back in the United States, Charles continued researching alternative spiritual ideas. So, like Dorothy, they looked for answers in New Age ideas. By the early 50s, Charles was captivated by ideas of flying saucers and visitors from outer space. He ended up traveling all across the country to attend meetings with fellow believers. In the end, he found his way to Dorothy Martin. When the pair met in June of 1954, it must have felt like a cosmic connection. When Dorothy explained her ability to channel Sananda and the Guardians, Charles seemed to believe her almost instantly. And though Dorothy didn't know it at the time, Charles brought something even more valuable than praise and validation. Back home in Michigan, he led a small group of around a dozen mostly college-aged adults who called themselves the Seekers. They held weekly meetings in a local Protestant church and, among other things, discussed broad topics like morality, philosophy, and metaphysics. After meeting Dorothy, Charles went back to Michigan and told the Seekers about her messages. With his stamp of approval, many others were quick to believe she was truly connected to otherworldly beings. Dorothy and Charles kept in touch and started visiting each other on weekends. While the two grew close, their relationship wasn't romantic. Charles was Dorothy's most loyal follower. At times, she seemed uncomfortable sharing her revelations. But with his encouragement, she became a reluctant oracle. The two of them propelled their new group into the spotlight, just in time to act on some disturbing revelations. Coming up, Dorothy learns the Earth is in danger. Pinocchio, Sleeping Beauty, The Little Mermaid. They're all iconic Disney movies. But did you know the original versions of these stories did not end with a happily ever after? Hi, I'm Alastair from Parcast, and I'm hosting a new Spotify original called Once Upon a Time. For nine weeks, we're commemorating the 120th anniversary of original Imagineer Walt Disney's birth by lifting the curtain and comparing some of your favorite Disney stories with their earliest tellings. Once Upon a Time will chart Disney's career triumphs, as well as the crushing defeats that almost ruined it all. We'll also look at what it took to bring these stories to life and why Disney's adapted versions became so memorable across generations. Follow the Spotify original from Parcast, Once Upon a Time. Listen free and exclusively on Spotify. Now back to the story. In the spring of 1954, 54-year-old Dorothy Martin believed she'd become a conduit for beings of a higher power called the Guardians. She claimed they'd tasked her with spreading their message. While she was nervous about going public with her revelations, her newest follower, Charles Lawhead, was all too eager. He spread word of her spiritual connection to a group he led called the Seekers. This small group of about a dozen, along with a few others Dorothy had met in passing, regularly came to hear her speak. Coincidentally, not long after these people got involved, Dorothy found something to say. All of a sudden, the previously vague messages she'd received evolved and took a distinctly dark turn. In May, Dorothy learned from the Guardian Sananda that great numbers of beings from outer space were coming to Earth soon. When they arrived, a time of warfare would begin, and much of humanity wouldn't survive. Sananda offered no solution to the mass extinction, but without an end date, Dorothy didn't seem worried. Her new followers didn't appear concerned either. Her communication with the Guardians frequently changed in tone and subject. The group's cannon often twisted and turned from day to day. Then, on July 23, 1954, Dorothy received another important message. This time, the Guardians had a date for her to look out for. They said on August 1st, a spaceship would land at a nearby airbase. This could be the opening salvo of the coming invasion. Even with the threat of an alien arrival on her hands, Dorothy didn't want to broadcast the news. She may have been worried about the public humiliation if it turned out she was wrong. She did let the information slip to Charles, however. As her closest confidant, Charles knew Dorothy didn't want to go public. 
However, he couldn't keep such earth-shattering details to himself. It was too important, so he leaked the information to a few other believers. On the day of the arrival, Dorothy reluctantly allowed 12 of her devotees to follow her out to the airfield. Charles, his wife Lillian, and the rest of the small group were ecstatic. They were sure something miraculous was about to happen. As they took some back roads looking for the perfect vantage point, the excitement only built. The summer sun beat down on them as they looked for any hint of a spacecraft, but as the hours passed, nothing appeared. After a while, the group took a short break to eat some lunch. All of a sudden, a mysterious man seemed to appear out of nowhere and slowly approach them. He didn't say much, but Dorothy felt strangely drawn to him. She went to the car to grab some watermelon for him. But when she turned back around, he disappeared. As the afternoon turned to evening, the disappointed group gave up on waiting for the spacecraft and drove home. For Dorothy, it felt like a complete failure. Yet when Dorothy regrouped with Charles and Lillian, they agreed that something odd and important had happened. Dorothy confirmed their feelings when she received a sudden message from Sananda the next day. He said he appeared to her in disguise as the man at the airfield. This quick fix to the narrative eliminated any lingering disappointment. Despite the failure of her prediction, most members of the group had more faith in Dorothy than ever. The Seekers wanted desperately to believe. Their commitment may have been connected to the brain's tendency to search for patterns. In a 2020 study published in Nature, researchers at Georgetown University found a correlation between people who had strong pattern recognition and passionate religious beliefs. According to the study, a core belief across major religions is that the sequence and structure of events in human lives and in the universe more broadly reflects an underlying order determined by the intervention of gods. Believers are more inclined to perceive events in the world as adhering to a purpose or design rather than as a series of random, unpredictable occurrences. During their research, the authors of the study made participants watch a series of dots appear on screen. Some were able to predict where the dot would land ahead of time because they could recognize the pattern. These participants were found to have a stronger religious belief. According to one of the researchers, cognitive neuroscientist Adam Green, the study showed that a brain that is more predisposed to implicit pattern learning may be more inclined to believe in a god no matter where in the world that brain happens to find itself or in which religious context. Human beings are experts at finding patterns, and because of that, we often draw meaning out of disconnected events. This seemed especially true for the Seekers. From the outside, it may seem like Dorothy was a simple con artist, telling her followers what they wanted to hear. But given what we know, that seems unlikely. She seemed to believe in her messages just as much as the Seekers. Her connection to the Guardians was the greatest gift she'd ever received. It served as confirmation that her life amounted to something. So, after the events on August 1st, Dorothy continued meeting with the Seekers. The group often made visits from Michigan to her house outside of Chicago to hear her latest messages. And the more she revealed, the more dire the situation became. On August 27, 1954, Sananda told Dorothy the ancient sunken civilization of Mu would rise from the depths of the ocean. When this lost land came to the surface, large parts of the globe would flood, killing millions. But there was hope for Dorothy and her followers. Before the calamity, Sananda promised a spacecraft would come to save them. Dorothy quickly informed her dozen or so followers. While she didn't know the exact date of the apocalypse, the majority of the group looked towards the future with trepidation. Yet despite how urgent the message seemed, Dorothy wasn't keen on letting others in on the secret. Even in the face of a world-ending flood, to her, the risk of another failure might have seemed too great. Charles Lawhead, on the other hand, treated the warning with the zeal it deserved. To him, the next move was clear. They needed to get the word out about the coming doom. Given Dorothy's caution, it's unclear whether he consulted her about his plans. Blinded by faith, he may not have cared. Charles pushed Dorothy to the sidelines to spread her messages himself. On August 30th, Charles and his wife sent out 50 copies of a pamphlet with Dorothy's prophecy to dozens of newspapers and magazines. His earnest efforts proved futile. No media outlets picked up the story. Not one to give up, however, Charles sent out the story again a few weeks later. 
This time, he attached his name to the piece, perhaps trying to use his position as a doctor at Michigan State to give the news some credibility. About three small local papers placed the news in their back pages. But after that, the story had been dropped entirely. While word didn't spread very far, by early October, it had made its way to the psychology department at the University of Minnesota. After reading about Dorothy's apocalyptic predictions, a group of psychologists led by Leon Festinger decided they wanted to know more about the Seekers. In their words, they were interested in researching a group who appeared to believe in a prediction of a catastrophe to occur in the near future. Seizing the opportunity for a cutting-edge study, the psychology department sent members of their staff to infiltrate the group and conduct research. When the first two arrived in October, posing as earnest spiritual seekers, they were both cautiously welcomed. Dorothy seemed unwilling to come right out and speak about her gifts. But they soon gained her trust and were allowed to join her. A third psychologist from the university and a few observers that the researchers hired also joined the group incognito. From within, they silently observed the meetings and recorded the group's actions. By that point, a date for the cataclysm had finally arrived, December 21st, 1954. Though it was only months away and the lives of billions hung in the balance, Dorothy didn't seem panicked. She resisted the idea of proselytizing, as if speaking about the Guardians might somehow jinx everything. That didn't mean she remained completely silent, however. On occasion, when the curious came to her door, she answered. This included local school children who'd heard rumors about the odd woman who believed in UFOs. But even this backfired. Parents grew concerned and called the police on her. No laws were broken and nothing came of it, but Dorothy knew she was on notice. Charles, however, was still bent on getting the word out and saving others. Little did he know that those researchers at the University of Minnesota weren't the only ones who'd found the articles about him. His bosses at Michigan State got wind of his activities, and on November 22nd, they fired him. When giving their reasoning, they claimed they didn't have any problems with his strange beliefs, but they claimed he'd forced the message on his students. There had been complaints. In the aftermath, Charles told the Seekers that losing his job was just part of the cosmic plan. He didn't think he'd have much need for a career after December 21st anyway. Privately, though, the dismissal appeared to have a chilling effect on him. As time went on, Charles grew increasingly insular. He made sure that no new people were admitted to the Seekers. The end was drawing near, and they needed to focus on their efforts. In light of all of this, Dorothy grew paranoid, too. Given her run-in a few weeks earlier, she feared the police were watching her every move. By early December, Dorothy was refusing to leave her Oak Park home in the suburbs of Chicago. Her husband, who had watched everything from the sidelines thus far, finally grew concerned, especially when Dorothy began a three-day fast to help bring clarity to her messages. Meanwhile, anxious excitement spread throughout the 15 or so members of the Seekers. They all waited on pins and needles to be taken away to outer space. By now, the date of the world's end was only three weeks away. They all expected to be saved well before then. But with each passing day, their apprehensions grew. They trusted Dorothy and the Guardians, but were terrified of being left behind in the flood. To prepare, several members quit their jobs and moved in with Dorothy. Most days after that were spent at Dorothy's house, as she received yet more messages. For these believers, their tight-knit group became the only thing that mattered. They severed ties with the rest of the world and looked toward their future outside the atmosphere. But the road to salvation would be rockier than they ever could have imagined. Coming up, Dorothy and the Seekers prepare for the end. Pinocchio, Sleeping Beauty, The Little Mermaid. They're all iconic Disney movies. But did you know the original versions of these stories did not end with a happily ever after? Hi, I'm Alastair from Parcast, and I'm hosting a new Spotify original called Once Upon a Time. For nine weeks, we're commemorating the 120th anniversary of original Imagineer Walt Disney's birth by lifting the curtain and comparing some of your favorite Disney stories with their earliest tellings. 
Once upon a time will chart Disney's career triumphs, as well as the crushing defeats that almost ruined it all. We'll also look at what it took to bring these stories to life and why Disney's adapted versions became so memorable across generations. Follow the Spotify original from Parcast, Once Upon a Time. Listen free and exclusively on Spotify. Now back to the story. By the second week of December 1954, Dorothy Martin and her followers were anxiously awaiting the end of the world. The Guardians, alien beings Dorothy claimed to communicate with, told her spaceships would save them before a cataclysmic flood came on December 21st. As the deadline approached, the Seekers continued their preparations. Dorothy insisted that everyone needed to discard all metal they had with them. Without giving many specifics, she said the metal would superheat when brought aboard the UFO. So her devotees cut all the metal out of their clothes. Metal zippers, clasps, and buttons all had to go. Time was of the essence, since the ship could arrive at any minute. As such, the Seeker's clothes often looked strange, full of patchwork and odd holes. But still, the ships didn't arrive. What came instead was much more earthly, but no less dangerous. The press. On December 16th, reporters gathered outside of Dorothy's Oak Park home. While Charles Lawhead's efforts to gain attention for the group had utterly failed in the past, he'd finally brought them calling. After he was fired from Michigan State College, word had slowly spread about his bizarre beliefs. It was a salacious story, especially with the apocalypse supposedly only five days away. The headlines wrote themselves. A university physician had been let go for getting involved with a doomsday cult outside of Chicago. But now that it was here, Charles no longer wanted the attention. Neither he nor Dorothy trusted the journalists. They both assumed the media only wanted to exploit them. They didn't really care about helping to save others from a catastrophic flood. But as the media interest increased, locals were also drawn to the spectacle. Many neighbors who had only heard Dorothy's claims in passing were suddenly interested in learning more. By the 17th, the phone was ringing nonstop, and people were constantly knocking at Dorothy's front door. The Seekers answered as best they could, but people were rarely allowed inside. Dorothy was still afraid the police would come after her. All the attention proved overwhelming. She hoped true believers would find her, but sussing out them from the enterprising journalists seemed impossible. It didn't help that some people were only looking to play a joke on the 54-year-old. Local teenagers showed up making false claims about the Guardians that Dorothy briefly considered. She was so desperate for affirmation that she believed almost anything. In the late morning of December 17th, while the Seekers sat in Dorothy's house, the phone rang once again. Despite the incessant calls from nosy journalists, Dorothy decided to answer anyway. On the other end of the line, a young voice introduced himself as Captain Video, which was the name of a sci-fi television character. In a steady voice, Captain Video told Dorothy that the Seekers should come out to the backyard at 4 o'clock. Then he hung up. Dorothy didn't realize that Captain Video was probably just a neighborhood boy looking for a laugh. Instead, she thought he was one of the Guardians. She immediately told the Seekers what she'd just learned. Anyone who hadn't already eliminated the metal from their clothing hurriedly cut it out. That afternoon, Dorothy checked the window to search the skies for a spacecraft. She was like an overexcited child on Christmas Eve. Just before 4 p.m., Dorothy and her followers went outside, bundled in jackets to counter the bitter winter breeze. But when the time finally came, nothing happened. Instead of seeing that moment as another failure, though, Dorothy deemed the entire thing to be a drill. It was all a test to make sure they were prepared. Sananda confirmed Dorothy's speculation later that night when he gave her another message. When she informed her followers, they took her word as gospel. For the researchers from the University of Minnesota, 
These events were illuminating. During the course of their study, they observed behavior that led to the coining of a new psychological term. The lead researcher, Leon Festinger, later called it cognitive dissonance, and it's gone on to be one of the biggest psychological breakthroughs of the 20th century. Dr. Leon Festinger theorized that when someone is confronted with something that stands in direct opposition to their beliefs, they become psychologically uncomfortable. To alleviate this discomfort, they may behave in ways that go against what they know to be true, or they might twist information they've received to fit their established narrative. In the case of the Seekers, this process occurred in a dramatic fashion every time one of Dorothy's predictions failed. For the Seekers, it was easier to justify the failure than to confront the possibility that their belief in Dorothy was misplaced. That explained why, around midnight on the 17th, the Seekers once again gathered outside in the cold when Dorothy told them to expect salvation. With the temperatures dipping, they tried their best to keep warm. But by 3 a.m., most were feeling frozen and gave up. No one had arrived to save them, and Dorothy was left disappointed again. This latest failure seemed to flip a switch for her. While she'd been wary of strangers coming to her house before, the next morning, she wanted to welcome as many as possible. Over the next two days, the Seekers waited patiently for any sign of a UFO. In the meantime, Dorothy proselytized to a growing crowd of curious onlookers. But with each passing hour, the alleged window for salvation shrank. Some followers likely questioned their beliefs quietly, while others who couldn't face the crushing disappointment doubled down. On December 20th, 1954, the last day before the apocalypse, the group gathered inside Dorothy Martin's kitchen in Oak Park. The anticipation had built for weeks, and now things reached a fever pitch. None of the seekers, especially those who had given up their jobs and possessions, liked waiting until the last minute for salvation. Within a few precious hours until December 21st, they imagined half of the world enveloped by the ocean as Mu rose from the depths of the sea floor. With another message, Dorothy reassured them. The spacecraft would come right at midnight and take them all aboard, for real this time. She swore she felt more certain than ever before. As the night came, the men and women sat inside her home anxiously waiting. By 11.15, the room buzzed with quiet excitement. Most sat around giving measured breaths to ease the tension inside. All of their eyes were fixed on the clock, counting down ever closer to the end. At 11.59, the second hand began its final rotation. Each second dragged. Then, at last, the hour and minute hands aligned. Someone looked outside. Nothing. The ground didn't shake, the water didn't rise, and no spaceship hovered above. At least one person decided to leave the group right then. They could no longer stand the disappointment. Dorothy's messages became meaningless. Hours passed in darkness. Dorothy began crying. Members of the group argued about the prophecy, trying to reinterpret its details. And still, even when the sun rose, believers remained clinging to their last hope. Dorothy, of course, had a new message. She told them the Guardians had decided to spare the Earth for now. They wanted to give the Seekers more time to capture an audience. After her prophecy failed on the 21st, the press was ravenous for the story. That morning, the phone continued ringing, and reporters came by to interview Dorothy and Charles in person. Dorothy seemed invigorated by the attention and tried to share her extraterrestrial messages with the world. But by December 23rd, public interest had faded, and the press packed up and left. That was especially disappointing for Dorothy because the Guardians weren't giving her much time to grow her faithful base. And she had a new prophecy. Now, a flying saucer would come at 6 p.m. on Christmas Eve night. As the moment approached, the remaining members of the Seekers experienced a gamut of emotions. Dr. Charles Lawhead, the initial driving force behind the Seekers, grasped at straws. To him, every twist and turn in Dorothy's message made complete sense. He never questioned the past prophecies, even when they turned out to be nothing more than random drills or misdirection. So when Dorothy told him on Christmas Eve that they needed to go outside to sing carols, he didn't hesitate. 
The desperate group gathered outside of Dorothy's home and started caroling. As the cold air turned their faces bright red, like eagle-eyed children looking out for St. Nick's sleigh, they looked up to the heavens and belted out the tunes. While their minds were no doubt preoccupied with thoughts of aliens and flying saucers, the curious onlookers returned. At first, there wasn't much of a public disturbance, but as the night wore on, the crowd size swelled to nearly 200. Someone called the police. If nothing happened now, the results would truly be devastating. Yet, Dorothy held fast. She and the rest of the Seekers sang like their lives depended on it. As the night wound down, the crowd slowly dwindled as people went to spend the holidays in peace with their families. And as gently as falling snow, the truth gradually dawned on Dorothy and the Seekers. The spacecraft wasn't coming. The night fell silent. In the days afterward, the spell was broken for many of the Seekers. Dorothy's words left them disillusioned and confused. The messages that had once filled them with so much hope were now meaningless. Dorothy's greatest fears were realized. On December 26, the police called her husband, warning him about a warrant for her arrest. While it's unclear exactly what the warrant was for, it likely amounted to simple public nuisance charges. While this likely wouldn't have resulted in jail time, Dorothy feared she would be committed to a mental institution. So the group disbanded and she fled to Arizona. It's unclear whether her husband followed. Even then, Charles Lawhead, her most ardent believer, didn't give up. In the months afterward, without Dorothy's involvement, he continued speaking about the Guardians at UFO conventions. We don't know how long he held out, but it's not hard to imagine that he, like the others, reconsidered his beliefs eventually. In January 1956, the research team from the University of Minnesota published their findings in a book called When Prophecy Fails. They recounted Dorothy's story and put forth a theory to explain her group's beliefs and behaviors. The following year, Leon Festinger published a book called A Theory of Cognitive Dissonance, which was informed by his experience with the Seekers. This study would be considered a landmark in the field of psychology. By that point, Festinger lost touch with most of the group. Every one of Dorothy's followers had looked for something that could shine light on a world that had grown increasingly chaotic, and they'd placed their hopes in an empty promise, one that, unlike the best Christmas stories, never came true. As for Dorothy, she'd found empowerment and meaning. In the time since receiving her first message, she discovered her voice. Despite her failed predictions, she never gave up her belief in her divine gift. At one point, she moved to Peru before returning to the United States to live in Sedona, Arizona. She started going by Sister Thedra and published several books about her spiritual beliefs. While she didn't have a direct influence on many other groups, her actions laid a foundation for other UFO cults like Fiat Lux in Europe or Heaven's Gate in the United States. had a gift for storytelling that resonated with audiences. From a puppet who wanted to become a real boy, to a mermaid who yearned to be part of the human world, Disney has developed relatable and unforgettable characters. Hi, it's Alastair from Parcast. Join me for Once Upon a Time, a special collection of Parcast episodes celebrating the original Imagineer himself,
as well as the origins of Disney's most iconic characters and stories. Follow the Spotify original from Parcast, Once Upon a Time, and catch new episodes Mondays, free and only on Spotify.